It's Friday morning, October 29th, and you are locked into Real Talk. Jesperson Hoyles and Brooks with you. A great show in store in just a moment. A Canadian comedy legend. After Bruce McCullough, we're going to talk to Jody Wilson-Raybould today. We're going to talk to Alberta United Conservative MLA Leela Ahir today. And then we're going to talk about a sense of place. The jumping off point for this week's edition of the Real Talk Roundtable. This show is presented by our title sponsor, Bitcoin Well, who has a ghoulish giveaway happening until the very end of October. All you need to do is carve up, this is for great Bitcoin enthusiasts, a Bitcoin-inspired jack-o'-lantern. Post a photo of your jack-o'-lantern on any social platform and make sure you tag Bitcoin Well. And you could win one of 21, if you know, you know, one of 21 limited edition Halloween hats and a $25 Bitcoin gift card. You can check out their Instagram ad for full contest details. Oh, and by the way, Bitcoin Well celebrating Halloween this year by giving out free candy and Bitcoin. What? This Saturday, that's tomorrow, at their head office in Edmonton on White Avenue from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can drop by, bring the kids, meet the team, get some sweet treats. If you're looking for details on this event or anything else, you'll find them under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. All right, in uh, 15 minutes or so, Jody Wilson-Raybould joins us. Very much looking forward to that conversation. We'll get into her book, Indian in the Cabinet. Of course, everybody knows Jody Wilson-Raybould. If you pay attention to federal politics, a remarkable story, and everybody's talking about this new book, which was released just before the recent federal election. But we lead off today with one of Canada's better-known comedians, uh, writer, director, best known as member, of the incredible sketch troupe, The Kids in the Hall. You've seen him directing shows like SNL. You may have heard of it. Schitt's Creek, Trailer Park Boys, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And he's got a a one-man show now, Tales of Bravery and Stupidity. We're going to have details on that in just a second. What a thrill it is to welcome to Real Talk, Bruce McCullough. Thanks for making time for us. And good morning to you, sir. You should be talking to Jody because she actually does things in the world that are important, not not some old pie faced mofo like me. <laughs> and I, my show isn't even about bitcoins. I don't know how I'm going to relate to you. Are you uh, are you into are you savvy with Bitcoin? I was talking to Mark Messier yesterday, and that's where we let off. He, he told me he likes to sprinkle a, a, a little dough into it every once in a while, but says he doesn't understand it too much. I don't know if anybody does. No, I my I've invested in 1972 Toyota Corollas. Ooh. Um, I have. A- 500 of them but they're not going up in value so i maybe i'll look into this bitcoin you never know though that might be one of the things where all of a sudden that vintage of corolla appears in a show perhaps produced by you and then all of a sudden everybody wants one yeah i should have that (laughs) that's exactly what i should do you know we put a lot of thought into producing this segment wanted to do your career justice and show you the proper respect and 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 at no point did we consider introducing you as a pie-faced mofo it didn't even occur to us right well it occurred to me as I looked in the mirror today and I'm seeing myself on Zoom. But thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, people are really excited. There's a lot that we can talk about with you because you've got a lot going on, um, including this show coming up in our neck of the woods. You're going to be performing at Festival Place in Sherwood Park coming up on Tuesday, November 2nd. And people can check that out. Tickets at Ticketmaster.ca. Some still available. But I know a lot of people across the country were thrilled to hear that eight new episodes of Kids in the Hall are set to drop. How fun was it to get the band back together, so to speak? Uh- It was great, you know, because we have done other things, obviously, since the show was on. Um, We did a mini series called Death Comes to Town a few years ago. Um, And we've toured a few times, as you know, we've been been through Edmonton. Um, It was a funny story when when we arrived, uh, we drove the tour bus from Calgary to Edmonton and we stopped at a red light and I saw a guy jump out of a cement truck and pull another guy out of his truck. And they started hammering it at each other. And I thought, okay, we're in Edmonton. (laughs) That's Edmonton, guys. Um, but no, it was. But we we haven't done this, you know. And the show is sort of the OG show. It's new music from Shadowy Man, new bumpers, old characters that are that have aged gracefully 
and pathetically sometimes <laughs> and um and new stuff new characters so it's it's a sketch show and it was it was fun to do to do this which we haven't done in many many years how does that does it come together when everybody's sitting around the table and everybody's kind of says like here's one of my favorite characters or here's something i'd like to revive if we could or how does that process come together everybody might have emotional connections to different things right yeah only, i mean scott's obsessed with his characters he thinks they actually exist and okay. should pay pay taxes um no everybody has an idea and then you know i have an idea for the opening and i go oh well, let's use dawn and marv from brain candy and it just sort of it just sort of flows organically in that way no one goes oh i want to do kathy with a k um but if you get an idea which we did that was a good one for her and the other kathy then then you you write it up and it gets in or it doesn't what do you think it was uh about that show that um you know it's, it's interesting because you talk to some people and they'll be like that's my favorite show of all time it's the most brilliant show of all time it changed my life and then you talk to other people that'll say sort of they compare the show to the tragically hip you know it's like this it, it, like owned it was like a, a, a titan of pop culture in canada and, and then they say but it should have been way bigger it should have been way you know how, how did you wrap your mind around what it meant to canadians especially during that era well, I think, you know, my wife says everything I touch turns to cult, um, you know, so uh, and yes, having been friends with the tragic or being friends with the tragically hip, that's that's sort of an honor. I think I think we are exactly where we should have been, which is, you know, and I think it's I think it's I think it's hilarious. The great brain candy didn't make much money. I don't know. That's who we are. You know, the book that was written about us was called One Dumb Guy. And it's like we're all smart, but together the troop is one dumb guy. So I I love that we can actually do it again. And I actually love that anyone cares. And um, I feel like we're sort of like blues musicians. You know, I, I remember, you know, seeing, uh, you know, blues musicians in their 80s just still doing it. Yeah. And I'm glad that we can still do it. Yeah, I love that. I, I think that's so cool. And, um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of some of the older, you know, having a chance to have seen like Neil Young later in his life or Tom Petty later in his life. And it was still just such an incredible moment. It's amazing when people's career can can span that distance. Uh, you uh, you did work. Didn't you do some directing with the hip, by the way? Um, yes, I did a, a video called My Music at Work. Yeah. Um and actually, I had a great friendship with uh, Gord Downey, and I sort of reference him and talk to him, uh, uh, talk about him, and the emails that we sent each other at the end of his life that were both uh, haunting and funny. Um, so yeah, that he was a great friend of mine. Are, are those? Do you consider those to be private, or would you tell us about that exchange? Uh, well, no, it was basically, you know, I, I at the end I said, I I know you're not sick. I think this is just a money grab. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and he laughed and then and then he said uh, he said no no we're um we're just gonna plow plow fields as we as we go across c canada and then he signed it gord downey friend of the farmer mm. which he became from then to the end of his life so yeah um they're 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 they were private but i made them public because of my great uh, love of that band and that man that's amazing do you we're, we're like rattling off the list of all of these you know projects that you've worked on and, and i've and i've only just scratched the surface i mean i think people would be surprised to see how many how many pretty significant comedy projects you've you've been a part of do you think that there's is there like a specific thing about canadian comedians that translates really well to writing in the states if you look at the list of of comedians in the States and then how many of them are Canadian ones that have made a real impact. It's, you know, representative of population. It's pretty significant. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, yeah, we're, we, and also writers because, you know, kids in the hall, I never think of myself as an actor. I'm a terrible actor. Um, I think of myself as a writer and I think a lot of Canadians think of themselves as writers. They don't think of themselves as stars. You know, I'm not about my success. I'm about the success of the thing I'm in doing. It's uh, it's interesting, this new one-man show. And again, I want to mention to people, people that are tuning in locally, you can catch Bruce McCullough at Festival Place coming up 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, November 2nd. Uh, some tickets still available. You can find them at Ticketmaster.ca. Uh, you, you talk a bit about your family life. You get a little bit personal, which is a bit of a change of pace, considering some of your other comedies, some of the other way, ways that you've approached your art. How, how does the family feel about that? Um, well, they hate it. But that's what they signed up for. You know, I mean, is there's a kind of, uh, no, it isn't. No. You know, hey, they live in a pretty good house. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I, I'm careful with what I do with my my family. And they know that, that you know, and it's, oh, there's me. There's Hall and Otis. That's my, my son, Otis. Well uh, done. 
Um, no, it's, it's part of it. And I have, I want, I have to talk about my life. You know, I mean, my life isn't more important than the audience's life, but it's as a reflection, uh, you know, to the audience's life. So if I talk about a bad sex weekend that my wife and I had, I think it's relatable to the audience. So that's why I kind of, that's my contract with the audience is to do that. What would make a sex weekend, a bad sex weekend? Well, you should come to the show. It goes on and on. If Hey, hypothetically, so, so say you're in Edmonton and two people get out of their vehicles and start to scrap in the street and you're like, all right on uh, here I am. How likely is it that those people would stop fighting, turn around and look at you and say, Bruce, how, how, how often, what's it like for you walking down the street on a well, daily basis? I, I think they'd, they'd swing on me. They'd say, I remember that little effort from Canada Dry. I've been <laughs> after him for 40 years. Amazing. Hey, this has been amazing having you on the show kicking off this Friday. Thanks for doing this. Okay, and, well, hey, yeah, of course. I am I am so fanning over Jody Wilson-Raybould right now. The fact that she is, I'm sharing a screen with that great, courageous Canadian. Do you want to, uh, and for, for our uh, folks that are t- tuning in on YouTube, the way that it works behind the scenes is that Bruce and Jody can see each other right now, but the audience can't see Bruce and Jody seeing each other. So this is kind of inside baseball. This is, yeah. you want to, you want to, I love doing this stuff when there's this mutual or shared respect, but well, we'll see if she respects you. I'm not sure, Bruce, yeah. but at least you like her. Um, you want to give me the first question to ask her? Um, well, it's the, the question I ask myself and you know, I, you know, I do a BIPOC show uh, called Tall Boys and my mm-hmm. Vance Banzel, who is from Edmonton. We always talk every day. We'd say, hey, did Trudeau, uh, did Trudeau get fixed the water today? We go, no, not again today. Okay. okay, so how many thousand fucking days are you not going to fix the water? How do you get away with that? That's the first question, because that's my outrage. And I'm just partway through Jody's book, but it's amazing. And I'm, I feel honored that she's a, that she's a Canadian. And I'm a Canadian and of all the work she's done. I think she should be prime minister. Bruce McCullough, uh, you can check him out at Festival Place coming up Tuesday, November 2nd, Ticketmaster.ca. Uh, of course, you can see Tall Boys, uh, an amazing sketch show. And of course, he's got a bunch of other stuff going on. You can follow him on Twitter at Brucio McCullough. Thanks for doing this. Thank you so much. Nice to I'll see you. I'll see you someday, Jody. What a beauty. I love that. Seems to be the type of guy you could probably hang out with for a few hours and not run out of things to talk about. Jody Wilson-Raybould in just a second. We wanted to remind you, Sam, is it okay for us to load up those photos that, that, that Real Talkers were sending us from yesterday, Miracle Treat Day? I wanted to lead off with this today. This is amazing. Many of you in touch with the show. We chose a couple. Like this one from Michael. I love this. He sent us this message. This from Michael who said, check this out. Michael had the little guy out yesterday. He says, this is me and the Bubsters. This is his little man, his little guy. He says, we're sharing two double cheeseburgers for seven bucks because nobody buys singles for five bucks. Doubles for seven and a large blizzard on Miracle Treat Day. Michael says, hashtag advertising works. I love it. And what about this one? This was great. Check this out. This real talker. This is Jason rocking his real talk snapback cap. Love it. You can find it on our website. He says, looks like a big success. Miracle treat day today. I can't wait to enjoy the choco dipped strawberry blizzard. Nice choice, Jason. Of course, Jason and everybody else that went to the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park yesterday contributed to the Stollery Children's Hospital, which is amazing. And what a moment for the ownership group. Our partners here on Real Talk, our sponsors yesterday, a big moment. Look at this, over a million dollars. They said, check this out. Those that have bought a Blizzard today, the stories, the stores donating all the sales. That's the big story there. And their total contribution, more than a million dollars over the years. Really amazing support from the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. Thanks to all the real talkers that showed up that let them know you were there because you're a real talker. They tell us. We were in touch with them yesterday. They said it was amazing to see. Makes me proud. Thanks, everybody. We've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. You don't have to pay very deep attention to politics in Canada to be familiar with the name Jody Wilson Raybould. Uh, she's a lawyer and advocate when it comes to First Nations in British Columbia and, of course, across the country. Uh, she served as uh, Canada's first Indigenous Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Uh, she also held positions Minister of Veterans Affairs, Associate Minister of National Defense until 2019. You may remember her resignation uh, following the SNC-Lavalin affair. Of course, she ran as an independent, uh, as an MP, and won which is no small feat, and she details the entire experience in her new book, 
Indian in the cabinet. A pleasure to welcome former MP Jody Wilson-Raybould to the show. Thanks for making time for us. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me on Real Talk. Appreciate it. So, so Bruce McCullough, I mean, in his words, he wants to know how many... I don't want to do it. I don't want to drop the F bomb early in the interview with JWR. I just can't do it. <laughs> but he wonders I heard, how, I heard. Yeah, you heard the passion. He says this is the source of his ire today. Is 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 the state of of clean or potable water on indigenous reserves. In your book, you talk about it. You give the Prime Minister a little bit of credit for making some progress on that file, but but let's talk about a big picture. Where do you land on that in response to what Bruce just said? Well, I I appreciate that it is a, an outrage in a, in a country such as Canada to have communities that don't have um, potable water, um, you know. And I do give the the government a, a credit for investing necessarily so in cleaning up um, drinking water on reserves in Canada. But there is more that needs to be done in order to have clean drinking water in the long term. Um, government needs to change laws and policies and enable Indigenous peoples to be self-governing and enable them um, to be able to maintain their water systems. And so it's a bigger question of governance in terms of indigenous peoples and enabling them to, to uh, you know, govern and, and make decisions in their own communities. You talk a lot in, in your book about what that looks like and, and, and I suppose what, what meaningful reconciliation would look like. And I wanted to get it. I mean, I'd love for by the end of our conversation for all of us uh, to, to be able to better understand what a couple of really tangible steps look like when it, it comes to, as you put it, the transformative promise of reshaping the Canada indigenous relationship. Now, I know that the obvious thing to say is, well, I mean, follow the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Report. That's an obvious place where people can start personally. People can start that as, as part of in their workplace, as part of an, an educational commitment, et cetera. But what are the top priorities you think that this government, a minority government, needs to put in front of Canadians and actually accomplish? Well, I, I mean, the top priority and, and why I was so engaged and excited about running in, in 2015 was the promise um, of rights recognition, um, the top priority and where we create the space for transformative change is to have the federal government stop denying the rights of Indigenous peoples and actually look at the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which at its core speaks to self-determination and create the space within our constitution constitutional framework for Indigenous peoples to rebuild their nations. Stop having to go to court to prove that rights exist, which they do, um, but actually create a new relationship with Indigenous peoples within a stronger Canada. That is where transformative change starts um, with treating individuals, Indigenous peoples, with mutual respect and, and dignity and recognizing their inherent rights. I had a chance to speak with uh, Negan Sinclair back on September 15th, and we talked about this a little bit, and I would love to get your take on what he put in front of our audience uh, in the context of what you and I are talking about right now. Uh, just for about a minute or so, this is Negan Sinclair from our September 15th episode. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples proposed a radical idea in 1996. They said, we should have an Indigenous parliament. And if you want to solve the issue of consultation, if you want to solve the issue of land redress, if you want to solve the issue of how do Indigenous peoples find partnerships within the country, uh, an Indigenous parliament seems to be the way to go. And if you want to replace an absolutely useless waste of time institution, it's called the Senate. Yeah. And so you, you could easily replace that Senate with an Indigenous parliament. You could have it in a similar body and role within the Constitution. And we could also have an Indigenous parliament in which... Uh, and I, I could imagine all of the different uh, special interest groups in Quebec and so on throughout the country that would just, you know, probably spin spin around and do cartwheels and anger over this one. But that Indigenous peoples would be partners in confederation. What do you think about what he proposes? Well, I, I, uh, I mean, I agree with him to to a great extent. What an Indigenous Parliament would look like is uh, something to to be talked about. I believe that the, one of the biggest issues facing our country, the unfinished business of Confederation, is exactly what Nigan is talking about. How do Indigenous peoples find their way in? 
this country. I, you know, I have um, for a long time been an Indigenous politician, entered into mainstream federal politics and realized I have a very different worldview. I was raised in my culture and the laws of our big house. The parliament, the governing system that we have right now can learn a lot from Indigenous ways of being and patterns of behaviors, laws and and traditions. So there's there's something to be said for that. And um, it starts with ensuring that Indigenous nations across this country can rebuild, can remove themselves from a racist colonial piece of legislation called the Indian Act, which controls Indigenous people's lives on reserve, and actually be partners in confederation. That's the opportunity that we have as a country. That's um, what I hear Nigan talking about and what Indigenous peoples have been asking for since... Canada became a country. You've got such an incredible perspective as, as as someone who obviously has has had plenty of time and perspective gleaned uh, in in Indigenous community leadership, also in senior levels of government and and senior cabinet positions. For those of us that have not walked in these shoes, that do not have this experience or this perspective, when you talk about and you're not the first guest on the show to talk about abolishing the Indian Act. Can you give us a sense of what that would involve and how viable of a step you think that might be? In other words, can you see this government or any other government actually pursuing that? Well, I, 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 I'm hopeful <laughs> and I don't um, I don't hold my breath, however, that this government is going to do what they promised to do. They've had six years, um, you know. I envision a, a world beyond the Indian Act and how we achieve that reality is to create a mechanism in this country in law to enable Indigenous nations, when they're ready, willing and able to move beyond the Indian Act and how they go about doing that. They self-determine to do it. They um, develop a constitution. They determine who their citizens are, how they're going to elect their leaders, um, what their priorities are. And we develop a mechanism to remove them. So in Indigenous peoples do not have to go to court or negotiate in interminable negotiations with another government, but that they're exercising their inherent rights to govern themselves um, as they did prior to, to contact. It's going back there and enabling what we have in this country, which is a cooperative federation, enabling Indigenous nations to be part of that unfolding and evolving um, cooperative um federalism that we we have in this country can we talk about the title of your book uh, indian in the cabinet yeah. I, i'm assuming that it's a, maybe a reference to the to the children's story the indian in the cupboard um how did you land on the on the the cover and and what do you want it to say itself just that that those powerful four words yeah, it's, it's kind of a play on, on that that book, but, uh, you know, it's something that was in the back of my mind for, for some time, not even realizing that I was going to write it, but I'm like, wouldn't this be a, an interesting title for a book? I mean, why I, I called it Indian in the Cabinet um, is, you know, I'm a proud Indigenous person from the West Coast. I came uh, to federal politics sitting around the Cabinet table as a proud Indigenous person. I'm still a proud Indigenous person, but I realized sitting around that table that I was um, to a great degree treated like an Indian. It was a microcosm of the reality that Indigenous peoples have faced for decades in terms of racism, in terms of um, discrimination, in terms of, of not being listened to or having somebody else think that they know what's what's good or what's better for for me so it's um, a reflection of of what i learned and how i was was treated to a great degree in in ottawa that i wanted to invoke in the, the title of the book i'm not necessarily comparing uh, your story to that of of mumilak kakak's uh, story but i'm curious for your insight the the uh, member of parliament formerly uh, out of none of it who who had in, in i think quite a profound statement to Canadians explained why she wasn't seeking re-election and and to me and we talked about this on the show I was like she is represents basically like everything that needs to be seen in the House of Commons for about 15 reasons uh and it was somewhat uh to be honest I think disheartening uh discouraging troubling to hear her assessment of her time there to say that she didn't believe that there was space for her or room for her there obviously you and her have different backgrounds, different perspectives, represented different parties, quite frankly, in different parts of Canada. But 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 
the common theme is there. Her saying that she didn't feel there was space for an indigenous perspective. Uh, what did you make of her decision to not seek reelection? Well, I, I, um, I have a lot of respect for Mumalak. She's a, a friend of mine, and certainly I support her in, in the decision, decisions that she makes. Um, she's uh, relatively young compared to me, and I know that she's going to contribute uh, hugely whatever she decides to do. Um, and, you know, potentially that would be coming back to, into Parliament. But she felt that that wasn't the space for her, and, and I understand and, and respect that. Um, but, you know, my story or Mumalak's story I don't want anyone to take from um, my experience. And this is why one of the reasons why I wrote the book is that it is incredibly important for Indigenous peoples, other individuals, diversity of Canadians to be represented in the House of Commons. And I would not want to discourage anyone from putting their their name forward. I think it's entirely within all of us uh, when we experience good, bad and indifferent um, things in life to speak up. That's why I wrote the book, because um, telling of my experience in, in Parliament, I hope people can learn from it, um, learn from how we need to revitalize our democracy, and that it's wholly remains within all of us to speak up and, and use our voices to create positive change. And that's what Mumalak did. She she created um, um, a huge amount of awareness, certainly, about her experience. And, and again, where things need to improve. And so I respect her for that. I should note, uh, I, I don't think it, it matters what your partisan politics are. Uh, you can't help but be inspired by a relatively young and uh, new member of parliament out of Edmonton, Blake Desjardins, who just won. Uh, and uh, and I think a lot of people are really excited to see what he's going to do uh, representing the NDP uh, out of Edmonton. Uh, you write in your book, if you're just tuning in, streaming audio live on the Mixler audio app, we're talking to Jody Wilson Raybold. Uh, as as your experience evolved or played out, the, the story that I think for the most part Canadians are familiar with on the surface Within the Liberal cabinet, uh, one of you know the Prime Minister's uh, biggest stars, I think, to one of his fiercest critics, if not the fiercest critic, quote, I'm still mad at myself for that, for being convinced at one point that the Prime Minister was an honest and good person, when in truth he would so casually lie to the public and then think he could get away with it. I mean, this guy's still the Prime Minister. A lot of people are going to go, whoa, let's talk about that. Yeah, I, I mean, I um, I was excited. I'm still, you know, passionate about politics and needing to address the issues that brought me into federal mainstream politics in the first place, issues of Indigenous reconciliation and justice. And the person that presented himself to me early on or in 2013, 2014, was not the person that I came to know. Um, but I mean, having said that, I believe in doing politics differently. I believe in open and transparent government and speaking the truth to Canadians. Um, this is what our politics needs more of less partisanship, which I found to be so overwhelming within the Liberal Party that I was a part of, so much so that it trumped any independent thinking that um, members of Parliament had um, when they go to Ottawa and represent their constituents. It was more of, of MPs representing the Prime Minister's <laughs> office um, back in the, in the writings, and that's just the wrong way to do politics. So, um, yeah, it was... Um, it, it is, um, and I continue to think about, um, you know, how I believed so um, overwhelmingly, and so many people did back in, in 2015, I believe that putting forward a platform and making a whole bunch of promises that we were actually going to keep them. <laughs> um, and I, I would never turn away from, from that belief. And some people might think it's naive, but I think that uh, um, I'm okay with the label if it means that we actually do engage in politics differently, which, you know, my writing did to a great degree in electing the first ever female independent member of parliament in the country's history it's not a small thing uh different story again different election different province B but i remember when brent rathgaber out of st albert fell out of favor a conservative mp fell out of favor with then prime minister stephen harper and decided to run as an independent the next federal election everybody went rathgaber's gonna it doesn't matter he's gonna win the guy's been unbelievable his public service record's unbelievable he's extremely popular he got smoked 
uh, by the conservative candidate, now member of parliament, Michael Cooper. Uh, and uh, I mean, I thought, you know, that reiterated it is not an easy thing to win as an independent. Why do you think you did? Well, I I um, I had I mean, I obviously realized that I had been um, very high profile in the mm-hmm. media for a long period of time. Certainly my exiting as a cabinet minister in the SNC Lavalin affair helped with that awareness among people across the country, certainly. But I mean, I have developed really close relationships in the community of Vancouver Granville, which I was so proud to represent for for six years. Um, I believe that um, I presented myself authentically, that I advocated for um, the constituents here in Vancouver Granville, and we had an amazing team that that went out and and engaged with people. Um, And, you know, I think it's a reflection of the reality that people are somewhat disenchanted with traditional politics, with the partisanship, with the um, blind loyalty that we're seeing in terms of how decisions are made, uh, and actually wanting some authenticity, some integrity um, in in politics. So that makes me hopeful. Um, certainly, we just went through a federal election, and there's some extraordinary people that were elected. You mentioned um, uh, Mr. Desjolais in, in Alberta. I mean, there's a lot of, of quality people that are are putting their names forward but uh, i think people actually do want a change in politics and we certainly need to be vigilant about our democracy and and revitalize it in a way that actually hears individual voices of members of parliament who represent so many people across the country this question's a bit off the board but I, i'm just curious for for your impression there's a i'm going to be talking to a, a conservative uh, MLA by the name of Leela Ahir right after I talked to you and, and she's called from within conservative caucus for the premier's resignation uh, which is no small thing obviously this after a lawsuit was filed by a former chief of staff against the premier's office relating to her dismissal she alleges that there was a, a culture of sexual harassment that there was uh, a, a, you know blatant and, and, and what would be characterized I suppose as inappropriate use of alcohol on the job by elected ministers and we've received a lot of feedback from people that have said uh, this is a very real problem for Jason Kenney's conservative party but this is not a partisan issue we've had a lot of people reaching out including a guest Kristen Rayworth yesterday that says this is a problem in politics there's a cultural problem a pervasive problem, a culture of sexual harassment, alcohol woven into it. Did you experience anything like that? Or would you agree with that assessment based on your time in politics? Well, I think I think it's the, the culture of politics is, I mean, there are a lot of receptions in Ottawa there. I mean, when we um, were what first went to, to Ottawa and we had orientation sessions, one for um, generally for MPs across the board. Um, the first two warnings that they gave us is that um, do not drink. I mean, there's a lot of drinking here and a lot of marriages end. So I thought that, or I think I mentioned that in the book, I re- remark that's a very interesting call or warning to people but there is that that um culture um doesn't mean that everybody necessarily gets involved in it but um it does exist and and i think um um the culture of politics um the um the cliquey nature of politics the control that um unelected people in in various offices including the prime minister's office has is something that needs to be addressed um uh there could be a a healthier work environment that's for sure how would you assess like based on your experience i'm I'm sure that you still maintain relationships and correspondence with some of your former colleagues within the liberal cabinet or caucus i don't know correct me if i'm wrong but but what's your take on the on the, the prime minister's popularity within the party a lot of people speculate the armchair pundits that this might have been his last election or perhaps we might see a new liberal leader over the next two three four years what do you think well, I to be honest, I don't actually talk to many people mm. within um, the like many liberal MPs. I mean, there's a handful that uh, I still stay connected to. I think there's, um, you know, from what I've heard, there's um, a lot of people that are are somewhat disgruntled with uh, the leader. Um, I, I look at the, the last uh, federal election as more of a vote for the Liberal Party versus a vote for um, Justin 
Trudeau. Um, who knows? I, I mean, uh, he uh, is probably going to stick around for a bit. But uh, from from what I've heard, there's uh, many people that are jockeying for a position to to head up the Liberal Party in um, the not too distant future. Would you ha- would would you care to speculate on who you think the next leader might be? Oh gosh, I I mean, I think that there's one that's being primed and um, I don't talk to her, but uh, mm-hmm. certainly the deputy prime minister, she um, would be one of the ones that I would think would be um, front and center of any leadership uh, uh, race. But uh, I'm not privy or, uh, to those discussions with uh, people within the party about that. You, you were critical of uh, former uh, Indigenous, uh, Crown Indigenous Relations Minister uh, Carolyn Bennett. You called it uh, hers, a poorly conceived plan an approach uh, to what Crown Indigenous Relations took on the file. Uh, We saw the Prime Minister's new cabinet earlier this week on Tuesday, and uh, Mark Miller, you know, remains in a a prominent role as Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. Patty Haidu moving from health uh, to Minister of Indigenous Services. What do you make of the new cabinet and the Prime Minister's choices on these two in particular? Well, I I have a lot of respect for for Mark Miller. I think that he um, did a, a reasonably good job when he was Indigenous Services Minister. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm pleased to see him moving into to Cerna. Um, and you know, I hope uh, he has. And he's very close friends with the Prime Minister, but I hope he has the the heft to push and advance um, the issues and fulfill the promises that are necessary um, to create that transformative change. Um, you know, Patty Haidu, I, um, she has a, a, a lot of work to do in, in that ministry. And, you know, even starting today, the government needs to announce its decision on whether or not they're going to appeal um, the Cindy Blackstock case around child, uh, child welfare. So, I mean, I, I, I wish for them um, to be very engaged uh, with these issues and I know that uh, um, in the relationship with Indigenous peoples, the Prime Minister continues to say that it's um, the most important relationship, but uh, actions uh, will speak louder than any symbolism that uh, has been exerted by this government. So I will uh, um, I'll keep pushing from my vantage point for them to do the right thing. You mentioned City Blackstock. We have had, had the honour of speaking with her on the show, and I, w- I wanted to actually ask you sort of a, a two-part question touching on uh, two stories. One of them reported actually a month ago today uh, when a federal court here in Canada paved the way for what they're saying could be significant compensation to First Nations children who suffered discrimination in the welfare system. Uh, this was after, of course, most people, I think, know the background. Two years ago, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruled the federal government had willfully and recklessly discriminated against Indigenous children living on reserves by failing to properly fund child and family services. Uh, instead of paying the compensation at that time, the prime minister said the government would appeal the ruling. And then, as mentioned, a month ago, a federal judge writing the tribunal's compensation was not unreasonable. A lot of people saying this is a good time for the government to move on from this. Right around the same time, this was also last month, the CBC reporting, uh, breaking the story that while you were justice minister, you were not informed, not even consulted on the federal government making a move to relieve the Catholic Church of its financial responsibilities to residential school survivors. I'd be curious for what you'd be willing to tell us about those two stories in particular and your perspective present day. Well, I mean, on, on, the, on the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, on the decision, I mean, the government has to announce its decision on whether or not they're going to appeal it today. I hope that they do the right thing. It's within their ability to, to not do that. Um, so I'm... I hope that that comes to pass. Uh, in terms of the uh, the Catholic Church um, and, and that decision not to appeal, that was a decision that was made prior to my um, being sworn in as uh, Minister of Justice and Attorney General. So that decision had already been made. Uh, I appreciate you uh, taking us into that and shining some light on that story. Uh, for the benefit of our audience, by the way, our conversation with Dr. Cindy Blackstock was back on June 7th. If you want to uh, check that out, if you want to take a look at that conversation, you can find it. Uh, you, your decision not to run again. I, I'm sure people have asked you a million times, and you're probably sick of talking about it, and there's no doubt that you will obviously continue to make massive impacts wherever you apply your talents, uh, wherever you apply your energy. But but what what was that final straw when you said, eh, I think it's time to move on, maybe at least for now? Yeah, I, uh, I have been asked, and I think it's an important conversation. And I, again, don't want to discount anybody or take away from the importance of running um, 
to be an MP or in any elected position. It's important for public service. For me, um, I just found it was not a healthy place for me to be or um I mean, yeah, in terms of my own physical well-being and, and wanting to be in a space that is more positive, um, I feel like I can contribute and continue to advance and advocate for the issues that brought me into Parliament in the first place in a different space. I think sometimes people need to remove themselves from certain environments in order to um, to help change those environments. So I'm going to continue to advocate for Indigenous issues, justice issues, Never say never. Um, I I might go back into into elected um, federal politics, but um, for me now, the the best place is to to focus on the issues that I've been focusing on my entire life, just in a different uh, environment. I sure appreciate your time today. I want to close with this, just you know, to get your take on on where you're at now, and 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 if you're finding any sort of I I know you're going to say no, but any sort of resolution, or at least if, if, if you're able to sleep at night in the context of where the SNC-Lavalin situation is now. It was a story, it was very fascinating, obviously, to, to see even how it was reported across the country. I mean, at the time, I was working for big legacy media, and, there, and the, the perspective was imposed on us as hosts with regards to whether or not the word scandal would be used. People would talk about scandal or affair or scenario, or you know what I'm saying? And, and all of these are editorial decisions, and, and I think a lot of Canadians perceive the story based on their partisanship. In other words, some people I think that are die hard, tried, tested and true liberals or at least siding with the prime minister on that one would say it's not a big deal. This type of stuff happens all the time. Other people would say this government needs to fall based on this. Where are you at today with that? I'm I'm very content and calm in terms of of SNC the decisions that I made around it I would make them again I think the lesson uh, importantly and I've been told and people have reflected this to me is SNC is a, an example or should be a lesson to all of us in that um, the ability for people around the cabinet table or the inner workings of power in this country. Um, wrongdoing can happen and nobody would know about it. Um, With respect to SNC, had I not been the AG, I'm not sure what would have happened. Um, But we need to be very vigilant about the nature of our democracy. And um, I think that we need to be more open and transparent to ensure that there are checks and balances on power and that decisions can't um, be made away from public knowledge. It's important for us to, to understand the reality of how decisions are made in this country and that's what I hope I was able to through that really tumultuous time bring to light the importance of the rule of law in this country the importance of the independence of our judiciary and how it is upon each of us to ensure that we uphold the fundamental tenets of our democracy. Jody Wilson-Raybould's new book Indian in the Cabinet already nominated by the way congratulations for a Balsillie Prize uh, a public yeah, policy book. That's got it. That, that's got to be a big deal, by the way. I mean, I mean, the sixty thousand dollar check would be nice, but even just the the recognition. That's got to. That's got to feel pretty good. I can't. I can't tell you. It feels really good. Like I, when I see my book sitting on the shelves in Indigo, it's like, wow, that's so it's very strange. But I'm really proud of the book, and uh, you know, it's uh, it was the result of a lot of years of of learning. So I'm I'm hopeful that people are enjoying it. But yeah, it's pretty crazy to see yourself uh, on the shelves in Indigo and other places. I know. I, and I independent bookstores. I, and, and, and independent bookstores, of course. Yes. I, I, I I'd be the, like the ball cap, sunglasses. Like well, it's nice now because you got the mask right so you can just keep walking by and just keep <laughs> look, just keep looking at the book maybe buy a copy i sign them yeah i sign <laughs> them when i go into bookstores that's amazing <laughs> pen around with you yeah, yeah. hey well you, you know you've made it when you need to leave the house with a sharpie right that's what they say <laughs> thanks for doing this jwr we appreciate it it's my pleasure it's nice to meet you yeah you as well uh jody wilson rabel the book indian in the cabinet Leela here coming up in just a second. Uh, this show is not messing around, Hoyles. This Friday show is not messing around here on Real Talk. Uh, you know who else doesn't mess around? The team at Kubi Energy. You know, because I've been telling you, I've been showing you photo evidence over the past number of weeks that they're working on industrial commercial applications. They're spending a ton of time on farms right now. 
checked out their Instagram at Kubi Energy, you'll see what I'm talking about. All these ag installations, more and more Canadian producers are looking to more sustainable solutions. Now, whether you get all the way to net zero or, or maybe just supplement your power supply, there are a ton of reasons why it might make sense for you. You can look up kubienergy.ca right now for a free quote. Of course, they do a ton of residential work as well in BC and Alberta out of their offices in Kamloops and their head office in Edmonton. We're proud to partner with the team at Kubi Energy. Athabasca University is Canada's online university, and there are about a million reasons why Athabasca U could be a great fit for you, depending on what your priorities are, depending on what you're looking to achieve. You want to upgrade your skills? You want to just learn a little bit more, that personal improvement angle? You want to better prepare yourself for opportunities in a new landscape job environment? Athabasca U could be the solution. You can check them out online to find out how it all works and how their world-class accredited online programs and courses would be a great fit for you so you can learn at a pace and during the times that work for your schedule at Athabasca University. And finally, before we get to our next interview, I'm proud to tell you that our two dogs, Moses and Monroe, are both eating Grand Dog Essentials. You can learn more about their quality raw food on their website, granddog.ca, but I want to talk to you quickly if you go under their Shop Now link about their supplements. They've got a ton of options here for dogs that have got that kind of, I'm not a veterinarian, but gut rot. You know what I mean. If puppy's not feeling good, nobody's enjoying it. Supplements from Grand Dog Essentials could be the solution. Plus, dogs with joint and muscle soreness, dogs that are having issues with their coat. If you know, you know. You can find out details on how you could improve your dog's life at granddog.ca. Don't forget, they deliver to your door in Calgary, Edmonton, and Central Alberta, and the promo code REALTALK gets you 10% off your first-time order. Our next guest, a very familiar face at the Alberta Legislature, first elected as an MLA for Chestermere Rocky View in 2015, re-elected 2019 as the newly uh, formed riding of Chestermere Strathmore's MLA. She served as Alberta's Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism, and Status of Women, and most prominently, just a couple of days ago, called for the resignation of her boss, the Premier, Jason Kenney, making her Real Talk debut. It's a pleasure to welcome Leela Ahir. Welcome to the show, and thanks for making time for us. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. There, there's a lot going on right now. A, a former a chief of staff within the United Conservative Party suing the premier's office legal action this week, uh, alleging a culture of sexual harassment, of alcohol use. It's got a lot of people talking and in some circumstances calling for you to leave the party, calling for you to cross the floor after you called for Jason Kenney to resign. You took issue with it pretty prominently to reporters the other day. Where's your head at this morning? I always find it interesting that when somebody stands up, and particularly a woman, that we're asked to leave, that it's our job to cross, that it's our job to move over, to do that, when actually it's imperative that we actually stay put and change the culture within the situation that we are finding ourselves in. And I, um, I'm probably even more committed to that today than I even was when those words left my mouth at the legislature the other day, because there are a lot of really, really, really good people, a lot of good people, a lot of talent around that table, a lot of strength. And, I, you know, when when you're given the privilege of being in a ministry like that, you know, I you don't you don't just do it for the sake of just being there. It is an action item. It's a call to action. Right. We talk about and, and I'm sorry, I have to say, right. I'm such a fan of Jody. <laughs> I was watching her when you had her on before when I found out she was going to be on your show today. Because I'm reading her book. I think I was probably one of the first people to purchase her book after it came on. But um, I, I have to quote her because this is actually what I believe. And she said in one of her interviews that. She wanted to see a leader who truly believes that when you bring people together from diverse backgrounds into political parties, it's not just to tick off boxes. You know, it's about it's about what what they bring to the table. And I've always been a strong person and a strong speaker, and I don't intend to go anywhere. And um, this level of bullying and nonsense that is going on has to end. It happens in all political parties, in all spaces. And this is a call to action, I think, for all of us in Alberta. Well, how significant is it? Uh, I mean, I can tell you from my perspective, uh, as an Albertan and as as someone involved or engaged in politics, how significant it is for me to see you call for Jason Kenney's resignation. But for yourself within that party, it's extremely significant. What got you to that point? 
Well, it's been a, I mean, there's been several things, um, but this is really for me, a failure of leadership. You know, when you think about, when you think about what you brought forward, because you know me, I have spoken in many, many times. I was, when, when I first became the deputy leader in, during the leadership race and then went on to become the minister, you have a deep faith in the people that you have around you and a belief that you are doing something important, that you're moving forward, that you're evolving, right? And, and we have to believe that in all of the people that we work with. We have to believe that there is a chance to see that happen. And, that, and I believe that with all of my heart. And then when, uh, when the, I hate to use the term, but the patio gate, situation happened. I realized at that point that this wasn't about politics anymore. This was about, um, or even about doing the right thing. The, there was a level of difference like you and me and what I say and what I do versus what our jobs are and our responsibilities and the, the level that we're held to at a political level and what the expectation is of the people who put us here when we have those opportunities. And to tell you the truth, Ryan, we probably wouldn't even be sitting here right now if the premier had just really like literally on that day come out and apologize because you know how tired all of us were at COVID point at that point. Everybody was exhausted. Everybody had made mistakes. Nobody would have been upset, you know, with him if he'd gone, oh my word, like that was just stupid and dumb and I'm sorry and moved on from there. But we saw from that situation that there's no capacity for that. And then, and also with the 215 children to go and talk about things at that point in time, look at, I'm, I'm as interested in a weedy discussion around important issues as anyone. Um, but when you are surrounded by beautiful people, people we love that we're engaging with, that we're trying to find reconciliation with, that we're trying to find pathways with, and you use that opportunity to push your own agenda and ideology, it's completely inappropriate. I've heard from a lot of people, um, even in announcing that you were going to be on the show, and I'll paraphrase the tweets, but they've basically said, where was Leela Ahir when this staffer, uh, when Ariella Kimmel was first fired? Where was she in the months following? Where was she in advocating for her or sticking up for her or calling for the premier's resignation six or seven or eight months ago? Why now? One real talker said to me, this reeks of political opportunism. How would you respond to that? Well, I think anybody who has had the privilege to work in this space of, um, especially when it comes to harassment, sexual violence, domestic violence, we're heading into domestic violence prevention month here coming in November. Um, when you are in a situation, especially when you're a survivor, um, this, is, this is a survivor story to tell. It is a story that needs to come out when they're ready um, with their timing and their ability. A lot of the work that gets done around um, working with survivors is allowing that story to come out when they're ready. It wasn't my story to tell Ryan and far from it. And quite frankly, um, when these issues come forward, Ari Ariella, you can tell from her article is a strong, competent woman. And if she had needed me to come forward earlier, you can bet I would have been there, but she is prepared and organized and competent and knows what she's doing. Uh, she went to the administration three, four times to try and, and get an understanding of what was going on. I imagine from her, and I, and I really, honestly, the, the questions that are being asked are fair, but they're not questions that need to be asked to me. These are questions that are for Ariella, for her sake, for her courage and for who she is. It's not my story to tell, but I'll tell you this much. The minute that I understood the truth of what was going on and she was ready to come forward with her story, you can bet, and I'll tell anybody who's listening, I've got her back and I will defend her. There have been interesting developments where, and I and I talked about this on the show briefly yesterday, we've received a pretty significant number of messages from credible people, you might describe mm -hmm. as insiders, that are saying, stick on this story, keep digging on this story, Ariella's story or experience is not the only one, this problem is way bigger than people will realize, you're on the inside, at least to a certain degree, what's going on, I mean, can you shine some light? to us on the culture down there in this context? Well, it gives you, it's interesting because, and I, I think I was telling you this yesterday morning when we were just chatting, um, when you're working and you're doing, it's actually 
I wish I could have something tangible to say to you, but to give you some suggestions, you understand that Ariella worked for the premier for 10 years. This was a strong relationship. This is a competent human. I didn't get anything done without her help, without, you know, she was able to take everything up the flagpole. She was our direct, you know, our direct um, person right to the premier's office. This is a human that knew she understood she's been in politics for a while um, for a while, I shouldn't say it, for a long time. She's a thick skin. She's a tough cookie. She's a rock star. If you can imagine that she had the courage within the system to go and ask for help, to go to senior leadership, to ask around the table, to get help, to get people to understand her situation, and she was not able to break through. Imagine what it's like for a junior staffer or a new person. I don't have any specific details for you. And I, I, I just, um, if I did, I would share them with you. But there is a culture shift that needs to happen. And it's not just in our party. It's right across the political board. I'm sure if we had Ms. Raybould back on, she would agree with that. It's right, It's an issue of when you're in a situation where you have people who are in, are in power and have the capacity to hold that power over people and you have... Um, people accepting unethical behavior from leadership over and over and over again throughout the spectrum of politics. And this is the shift that needs to happen. And perhaps Ariella's story is, is about her and who she is. But what's really, really significant about this is that it forces us. We have no choice and shouldn't have. We cannot go back. We are responsible for the actions that happen after this. And we are responsible to make sure that there's a change in the culture. I popped in on our live chat and, and I think some people are, are giving you credit uh, for, for you calling publicly for the premier's resignation. Other people, Leela, are saying, where was Leela on the curriculum? Like, where was Leela on best summer ever? Where's Leela been on a whole bunch of things that have been troubling indicators from this government? How would you respond to those people? Well, and again, um, there is, no doubt in my mind. And I, I called also, um, if you recall, I assumed actually that Premier Kenny was going to resign um, a month and a half ago when we had had a caucus meeting that had been called at that time. Based on the fact of failure to leadership throughout the summer, um, the, it's intensely it's intensely, it's mortifying actually for me um, to see that when he was away that he didn't trust anybody around the leadership table to leave in charge while he was gone. Believe me, I, I have no problems with people taking breaks and, and going away, but um, the, you need to be able to have enough trust in your leadership team and the people you have around you. And he has a tremendous amount of competency around him and those ministers that are there to be able to leave somebody in charge while he was away. Um, more than that, I, I'll like, I, I was, there was there is a way and a layered methodology to the way that we have to look at COVID. We 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 have protocols for a reason. And to to take the gas pedal off at that point in time was completely wrong. Completely, completely wrong. I think all of us have acknowledged that. And even at the same time, and you you can ask anybody who's around that table, there were so many of us going, whoa, 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 whoa. Just a minute here. And, you know, and, and I'd like to I'd like to say also, you know, there's a lot of people who throw the stampede under the bus. The stampede was a an amazing organization that was a pilot project in some ways of how it was that we were going to be able to put our lives back together. They did everything right, Ryan, everything right. They had. Um, testing on site, PCR testing, rapid testing. They were checking at the doors. I, I would suggest even we're probably ahead of everybody else in asking to see if people had been vaccinated at the doors, making sure, because you can imagine from their point of view, the last thing that they would have wanted was to be a super spreader event, right? Just as an organization. Okay, nightmare. So they would have been a nightmare. And you didn't see that happen, not because of anything that we did, but because they're amazing. They're a, an incredible organization that deserves full credit for the work that they did at that time. And if we had followed the lead of what they were doing at that time and seen that there were opportunities to look at how it is, you know, because we'd gotten to 70% at that time, what a wonderful opportunity for people who had worked so hard to get their vaccine. And, and you know, people were nervous and there was hesitancy to be able to have the opportunity to have 
to be rewarded for that. And then you layer it, you know, like, what do we do when we get to 80%? Well, this is what we can do at this point in time. And then also remind people that if hospitalizations are going up or if we see, you know, ICU numbers going up, that there are serious situations that we need to look out and monitor. And that's what should have happened in that position. And I, again, I'd already, I'd already mentioned about that before. And um, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that, that the messaging, the way that we needed to do this, the way that we needed to come forward, the way that the monitoring should have been done, how we handle it. And the minister copying the new minister of health has said this over and over and over again, that that messaging, we should have never taken our foot off the gas pedal when it came to that, because we were in, on a roll. And even when we came to August and, and all of a sudden the protocols were gone, there was so many of us calling going, oh my word, what are you doing? That's abs- it's because we saw the numbers, I think on the day, I think it was August 13th, right? When they had mentioned that they were going to take off the protocols, we were seeing the ICU numbers going up. All of us were concerned about that. Um, but at the end of the day, Leela, let me ask you, cause I, I don't want to doubt your sincerity and you say we're all concerned about that and people around the table, you know, voicing their concerns about opening everything up in the best summer ever. But people are sitting here across the province in a lot of jurisdictions where COVID is quite frankly out of control, or at least was at that point saying, where was my MLA. And I'm not just talking about you. Yeah. Where's yeah. my MLA? Why is my MLA not saying anything? Where's my MLA's voice on this? And, and people sort of go, oh, well, they're afraid to speak up because of the power structure. And like, where are these MLAs speaking out? There's all these rumors about how the premier's really lagging in popularity within his own caucus. But I don't think that constituents see evidence of it with regards to pushback. Yeah, I can't speak on behalf of the other MLAs. All I can do is speak for myself. Can you give me a sense of what the dynamic is like of somebody who may speak out? I mean, can you give us, to be quite frank, real talk of the risk that you may take just from by speaking to me? (laughs) Oh, I'm I'm sure I'm sure um, you must know by now that I I, the risk is not an issue for me. Um, But it. Let me put this to you, Ryan. How many how many of my colleagues have spoken out to defend even the position that I have right now with regards to the toxic environment with within the within our with our another situation on behalf of Ariella? You haven't seen that. And there's a reason for that. And it'll be interesting to see how things come ahead. I, like I said, these are wonderful human beings. And this isn't about a party situation. This is about leadership. If you have strong leadership at the top, and the ability to work these things out and bring a family together, which a caucus really is, because you spend more time with each other than you even do with your family. It's a huge, it's a huge, huge shift in your life. And if Premier Kenny truly cared about the family that was around him and did listen to them, and believe me, believe me to anybody who's listening, your MLAs do defend you and they stand up for you all the time. I hear it all the time. But you have to have a leader who's willing to listen to you and remove that toxic situation around that table in order for those voices to be heard. And for somebody like me to come forward, I don't have any political agenda. My agenda is for the people of the of my riding and of this province and the ones who've entrusted me. I've I've had a huge privilege, Ryan. I've traveled all over this province. I've met thousands of people. I feel committed and very, very um it's they're they're my people, they're my family, they're my friends. I love this province. So this isn't about me. This is about them. This is about the province. This is about what they deserve. And this is truly, truly about failure in leadership and a failure to unify and bring people together. People have all kinds of theories uh, about why you may be speaking out. You know this because I see them tweeting them at you all the time. Many mm-hmm. people are saying, well, Leela wants to be the leader of the United Conservatives. Some people think Leela wants to pair up again with Brian Jean, former Wild Rose leader, and see him uh, come in and lead this party. I'm curious to know, how would you respond to that? Do you have leadership aspirations? Do you see yourself running in 2023 under the United Conservative banner? And who do you think will be leading the party at that time? Well, the, the, ooh, that's a lot to unpack. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, um, we're a grassroots party. There are tremendous processes for anybody who would ever even want to be leader. So there's no there's no clear pathway to that for any person. And this is to anybody who may. Um, but we're truly a grassroots party. I If that was ever even a, an inkling for me, I'd have to earn that from the people of this province. But right now, um, that's that's not even an issue. There is an there is a lot of talent around the premier in his ministers who could easily easily step in if he had the grace to step down. 
down at this point in time, given many, many situations, many, many issues. But if he had the grace to step down right now, there's so many around him that have the capacity to be able to step in and be an interim, bring Alberta back together. And I think maybe I don't, I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to interrupt you okay. for a second, okay. because I think some people might suggest that the well is poisoned to a certain degree. And I know that because I get responses on mass anytime we talk mm-hmm. about this and, and people say, if Tyler Shandro steps in or if Jason Nixon steps in, this is just going to be more of the same. Rick McIver people times often invoke his name. I know some people have talked about maybe Doug Schweitzer as someone having potential. I mean, is there is there one of your colleagues that you would be comfortable with taking over that mantle of leadership? Well, it's not up to me. We would, as MLAs, we would determine that. There would be a vote, right? So, but that when you would be talk determined. about people that you say there's a lot of talent there, there's a lot of people that are competent that could step in. I mean, who, oh, sure. Who, who are yeah. people you're talking about? Oh, well, it's funny. You mentioned all guys. I would may- mention all the women. Yeah. Well, <laughs> who impresses Honestly, you? Oh my goodness. Well, there's too many. I mean, I all like, um, well, Sonia Savage, Rajan Sani, um, uh, Rebecca Schultz, um, Minister Pond. Uh, there's just so there, these women are amazing. They're rock stars. They have, um, incredible competencies in their own background and who they are as in individuals outside of politics and the work that they've done to advocate. Um, I would have absolutely no problems with any of those fine ladies taking a step forward and uh, putting themselves into that interim position should Premier Kenny have the grace to step down. You know, I've, I've got several friends that live in Calgary. I would describe them as very savvy, uh, sort of white collar professionals, so to speak. And, and, Several of them are quite impressed with Sonia Savage. She, yeah. she wound up with a whole bunch of egg on her face last week. And I'm curious to know your assessment of how damaged her brand was uh, with regards to this Allen inquiry and everything that came along with it. You think that she can move past that? What is it about her that impresses you? Oh, my goodness. Well, you've heard her speak. Um, she is a level of calm that you don't normally get in a portfolio. She's one of the most powerful people in the province at this point in the ministry that she sits in. And she does it with such humility and grace. And with respect to the Allen inquiry, she's handled, um, because like with anything, there's many interpretations. And she has handled that with such immense grace. And she will use the information that she needs to from that inquiry to make sure that oil and gas and, and other products that are coming out of the diversity of that sector have their day, that she is able to make sure and protect that those sectors have the ability to move forward. And I'm very grateful for her. I think she's an amazing human being. Leela, we've got, we know we got to respect your time. I've got a, a round table ready to rock as well. So let me ask you this in closing. Uh, you made a really interesting um, refer, or kind of used an interesting metaphor when you and I spoke on the phone yesterday, describing the United Conservative Party as an arranged marriage. And I actually yeah. thought that was great insight. And one of our uh, viewers right now says, you know, with respect to, to, to Leela, this is Craig. He says, I don't think a leadership change is all that's needed. There's an entire rebrand required. Uh, Craig wonders, what do you think about a new party, maybe even bringing back the progressive conservative name? I know that there's stuff that happens behind the scenes that'll keep that yeah. name from being resurrected. But but do you think that this brand can survive this arranged marriage? Well, yeah. And the arranged marriage thing was like you, you bring a group of people together, you know, for the sake of the unity piece of it. Right. And uh, you're not all in love with each other. And it takes tremendous leadership to bring that love together around the table and to build a capacity and a, and a loyalty to some degree, right? For the, what you're trying to do and, and what you're trying to create as uh, when you have the privilege of government. Um, I absolutely believe that the, the party itself is being damaged by the leadership, not the party. It's, it's, it's completely different things. And I know people are conflating those and, um, but that's because you only ever hear a few voices and that's the shame about it is like I said, there's just so much talent around the table and um, I would love, 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 love to see fresh leadership that ha- understands how to bring something like this together and give the opportunity of these tremendous humans that were all elected by Albertans. And most of the people who are who are engaged are, are actually talking with their MLAs. Their MLAs are extremely engaged in their communities. I know that. And so we're all hearing it. We all know it. we all want to do better. We all want the opportunity to do that. But you need really strong, confident, compassionate, thoughtful leadership at the helm to be able to accomplish that. 
kind of lied because I said that was the last question, but I did have to ask you this. <laughs> and, okay. And, and I, 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 my, my nightmare is that our roundtable participants start to drop off and walk away and make coffee. And we put the Bruce whole show isn't, behind. Bruce, Bruce isn't going to go anywhere. He he has advice for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Exactly. Um, in, in closing, I mean, in 2019, you were appointed right, right after the election, a couple of weeks after the election, uh, appointed Alberta's Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism, and Status mm-hmm. of Women. And I know a lot of people have uh, been, I think, poking fun, laughing so they don't cry that uh, Ron Orr, that, that essentially, let me just put it this way, that a man is in charge of the Ministry of the Status of Women right now. Your thought on, on ultimately who proved to be your replacement and, and the status of that ministry right now? Well, I, it's interesting. Like, uh, again, the uh, ministry ministers are chosen at the purview of the premier. So that there's that. Um, one thing I have to say, uh, Minister Orr has brought forward a piece of legislation that we had worked on for a couple of years, which is the Artist Profession Act. And I'm so grateful. It takes some, um, when you go into a ministry, you always want to try and make it your own and do all of that. And I have to I have to give uh, a tremendous amount of gratitude to Minister Orr for continuing on with that legislation. Um, and um, very, very grateful because it's going to mean a lot to the artists in this province. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I don't understand what even happened. I still to this day don't know why I was, why I, my, why I lost my ministry other than speaking out. Um, so I, you know, I wish them the best of luck. I'm here to help out as much as possible to make sure that they're successful. Because the truth is, Ryan, is that if they're not successful, UCP and province and people and all of the people we represent aren't successful. So I wish them all the success in the world and I'll be here to help out in any way that I can. Leela, I really appreciate you granting us this interview. I appreciate your candor right now. Thanks for doing this. Ryan, I'm honored that you would um, have me on. I am really, really grateful. And thank you so much. And much love to all of you who have taken the time to listen to him. Truly honored. Appreciate that. The door is always open. And, and, and you pass that along, Leela, please, to your, your colleagues, okay. the, including the ministers with the United Conservative Party. Thank you. All right. That's Leela here, the MLA, uh, the United Conservative MLA out of Chestermere, Strathmore. Uh, you can let me know what you make of that. You can send us an email to uh, to talk at ryanjesperson.com. And, of course, uh, a reminder that we are going to be getting into some of your emails later in the broadcast as we present Trash Talk in partnership with our friends at Local Waste Services. I want to remind you right now that uh, just because we're heading into the winter months, can you believe we're almost into November? The team at Eden Landscaping is not hanging up the boots and putting away the shovels, so to speak. There are projects that they can complete through the winter months that could improve your outdoor winter experience why not envision barbecuing in the middle of january with a new maybe a new cover over top a nice gazebo over your outdoor kitchen space what about some sort of a pergola over the hot tub you can be out there while the snow falls and of course these three season rooms that so many people are looking at to expand the footprint of their dream space eden does it all you can check out their portfolio including some beautiful projects at landscape edmonton Ca. Our friends at Park Power want to remind you that you can go anywhere. You can choose where you get your electricity, natural gas, and internet. Why not look to the company that supports Real Talk, your favorite show? At parkpower.ca, you can compare rates. You can look into the fixed rates. Again, they'll be renewing November 1st. Those of you that didn't get in, uh, there's limited opportunity for those fixed rates for the month of October. Why not look to November to make that switch? It's never permanent. You can always back out if you need be. And of course, when you bring your business to Park Power, the promo code 2021-REALTALK gets you $70 off your first bill. It's October 29th, which means we're two days away from Halloween. Hoyles, brace yourself. Our friends at Friesen Brothers want to, me to remind you about their Boo! Go! Special. At the 16 Friesen Brothers across the province of Alberta, Boo! Go! means you can buy one, get one, free on a whole bunch of Halloween stuff. You handled that like a champ. This is the last one, so I'm glad I finally got it at the very end. This is the very last Boo! Go! mention. No. Yes! Yes! No! The first one, not even a blink. I was, you were just stoic. You were steadfast. So impressive. Friesen Brothers for more than 65 years. Alberta-grown and Alberta-owned.
Well, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Every Friday, we bring you our Real Talk Roundtable. And this one, we're dedicating to a sense of place. This was one that was actually pitched to us by one of our guests. And I love it. And I'm going to get her to explain why she wanted to tee this up in front of this engaged audience. What a pleasure to welcome back to the program. She's the executive director of the Edmonton Downtown Business Association, Punita McBrien, Indigenous community leader, Cheryl Whiskey Jack. And joining us from not Tanzania, like I teed up yesterday, but Tasmania, where he's the CEO of Brand Tasmania, Todd Babiak. Yesterday, I said it in closing, Babiak, as we're wrapping the show, there was like five seconds till we faded to black. And I said, and live from Tanzania. And I saw the entire team go, no, 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 no. And then it was too late to say anything. Tasmania. It just goes to show, you know, branding a place. Very important, isn't it? I have some work to do. <laughs> well, what time is it over there? You're joining us here, making a bit of a sacrifice. What time of day is it? Oh, it's 2.45 a.m. Thank you for this. We very much appreciate it. Hey, Pumita, we're, Punita, we're going to be talking about sense of place today. And this was an email that you sent us. We loved it. We fell in love with the idea right away. Uh, take our audience into why this conversation is important, why we're going to have it right now. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And, and Todd and Carol were both my first choices of people to have this conversation with. So I'm really, really happy that they're both here to join us for it. Um, it's something that's been in my mind for a long time and, and partly, I guess in a big way, because of what my job is. So for those of us who are in charge of essentially marketing the place that we live, um, you know, for me, it's downtown Edmonton specifically, obviously, encouraging businesses to locate here, people to want to live here, spend their time here, spend their money here. Um, how we talk about a place, the stories we tell about a place, the attitude that we have towards a place, all of that is what sort of builds up and becomes the identity or the brand, uh, which I'll let Todd talk more about, um, of, of the place. And then, and then for me, it actually goes a lot deeper than that because it's also like for me, and I, I have this theory that it's something that that children of immigrants and a lot of new immigrants have in common with our indigenous neighbors that I feel a really, really strong connection and deep appreciation for the land that raised me. And so I, uh, it's so interesting when we let, I'm going to say this diplomatically, obviously the, the conversation you just had is, is one of the things that are in the headline right now about Alberta. Um, when we let, whatever is dominating the news cycle about our, our political parties, or our current elected leaders, whatever might be going on. When we as, as Albertans, as Edmontonians, when we let that define the place and, and we have this attitude that, you know, if you're not happy with the current government, um, that, you know, these things start to come out on social media, statements like, this is the bad place. I hate it here. Um, can't wait to leave Alberta. Like all of these sorts of sentiments which, you know, often I'm sure are coming from a very real place if people are experiencing hardship. But I just, I, I, it, it drives me a bit insane because I just feel like it's a self-defeatist attitude. It, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it, to me, it's profoundly disrespectful to the land and, and to, frankly, everything else that constitutes what a place is and what it means. We think about our communities, our neighbors, our culture, our businesses, our um, everything, all of the other things that make up what a place is. And we're going to let whoever's currently premier and whatever, you know, controversy he's embroiled in define this place above all else. So that was my sort of rant uh, that I that I sent over to your team, and I'm glad that we're here to talk about it. Well, I mean, and and all three of you have really interesting approaches to this. I know, Todd, you've you you know, we could describe you as an Albertan abroad for sure. Right now, the CEO of Brand Tasmania, you're the co-founder of Story Engine, uh, and and you've been a branding expert in hel and, and helping, which might sound like an abstract idea, but I know you can explain it to us. You've been you've been helping places or people speaking on behalf of places understand how to tell their story, how to develop their brand in a way that's meaningful. Uh, what do you make of what Punita's saying right now about, about the, the, the lack of respect shown to the land or to the place? Well, she's exactly right. I think most places 
make the mistake of hiring an advertising agency to come in and, and maybe just give them a new logo or a tagline that they can use as though they were toothpaste or uh, a bottle of, of maple syrup. And it's so much deeper than that, as Panita was saying. Uh, it, it is a spiritual matter. And that's why we called our company Story Engine in the beginning. And um, when we found moving into cities and, and regions and places, uh, the hardest and most meaningful work it was because when you actually listen to people and you hear the stories they tell about why they've chosen to live where they live, uh, why they chose to stay, uh, as Panito was saying, why aren't they leaving? And if you had to leave, it would break your heart about it when you can actually ask people those questions and get at examples of what makes it so special. Uh, you do tend to hear something consistent because the people who, who live in a place, they do have a connection, whether it's like uh, Punita's connection or Cheryl's connection or my connection or your connection. There is something there. And if you listen, you will find normally there is, there's something they have in common. And if you can, in a sense, distill that into something you can use for your trade and export, for tourism, for attracting more wonderful people who will be successful in Edmonton or in Calgary, uh, investors, students, and you're giving them the right product and pitch and telling them the story that might move them, uh, you're creating, a, I think, a community versus uh, we're going to give you incentives and we're going to try to do this as though we are marketing, as I said earlier, a consumer product. That's when you tend to break people's hearts. Cheryl, uh, for people that don't know, you're executive director of the Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society, uh, which is an urban indigenous community organization uh, serving people in areas like housing and employment and newcomer settlement services and and so much more. And, and through the course of our conversation, I want to learn more about what you're doing. Uh, let me ask you out of the gates. I mean, we talk about a sense of place and we may talk about where, you know, where people are, are tuning in from, whether it's it's Edmonton or Winnipeg or Toronto, or maybe we see it through the lens of Alberta or Ontario, or maybe we see it as Treaty 6 or Treaty 8, or maybe people identify their place or perceive their place or connect with their place in, in different contexts. How are you connecting with the argument that Punita is making? Well, I was really excited to get the invitation to be on the show to talk on this matter. And then after hearing Punita talk about what, you know, what made her uh, write to you guys and say that this should be a roundtable discussion, I'm even more excited. Um, my first experience um, with placemaking as, as a person and as an Indigenous person came in a comedy club. Um, I was sitting in this comedy club, there was a comedian from Chicago, so it was through the eyes of a visitor that I looked at my city. And he said he just came from a show in Cal Calgary, and then he came to Edmonton and he said, nice city. Um, but you do know you're on Indian land, right? And uh, that's the vernacular they use in the States. And, uh, and people got kind of quiet, nervous laughter. And he says, you know, you go to Calgary and you look at every street and you know you're in Blackfoot country. You come to Edmonton and you have streets like White Avenue, Yellowhead, you know, um, he, he, and I just laughed. I was probably the only one laughing in the comedy club, but it made me kind of look at my city in a different way from that that day forward. And, um, and Panita's uh, observation about people looking at our province based on what's happen happening here politically, and even civically, you know, the, the downtown business association was dragged into the civic election uh, for some of the issues that downtown's experiencing. And one of the things we do here at Bentero is we uh, do indigenous awareness teachings. We do it for all of our staff, it's mandatory. We also do it for our colleagues in community. And one of the things we've changed over the years is uh, the training used to be two days, it's still two days, but it used to be um, everything, sort of dark and light, you know, the dark parts of history and the lighter parts of our culture and the, the vibrancy. Uh, we changed it all to two days of goodness because it sends our practitioners out into the field with a really positive view of the people that they're going to be working with every day. And um, we still need to talk about those dark parts, but not as we're preparing them to go out into the field to do that work. And uh, yeah, so, and land acknowledgements is another thing I wanted to talk about. Land acknowledgements um, is something that's really awkwardly talked about, awkwardly done. And I'm trying to make it like an everyday feeling that you have about the land that you're on. Um, I spoke to someone on Twitter who took a picture of a sunrise and said, 
you know, when you describe the feeling you have, you're acknowledging the land that you're on. So try and think about it from that perspective instead of words on a, on a script. Let me follow up with you, Cheryl, on that. You talk about land acknowledgements, and, and some people are, are so grateful to hear them. We discussed them back on our October 18th episode. If if audience members want to go back and, and participate or, or take in that conversation, a lot of people, though, say it's uh, it's theatrics, right? It's disingenuous. It's, you know, people are doing it as some form of virtue signaling. Why do you think it's so important, and, and why might you disagree with those assessments? Think of yourself as a traveler, you know, uh, lots of people love to travel, especially in Alberta. We like to get away from this place when it's really cold and dark. <laughs> and uh, when you go to these other lands, you don't expect them to conform to what your idea of home is. Um, they are who they are and you adapt to that land that you're on and you go. You're obviously appreciative of that land that you're on because you're making time and spending a lot of money to go there. You know, you go to Europe, everything's in the language of the land. Uh, you come here and it's not quite the same way. And so having those land acknowledgements um, acknowledges the people that were here before you that create a space for you to come and also make a home on this land that you're on. And people do love Alberta. I really believe that. Panita, uh, Cheryl touched on it. Uh, we don't have to spend too much time on it because the results are in with regards to the municipal election and, and the candidate that did issue a travel advisory uh, for downtown Edmonton based on how dangerous it is was the people spoke and he's not the mayor elect. So I'm not sure it landed the way he would have liked. But I do know that you and your colleagues are going through uh, what you've described as a place branding process uh, for downtown Edmonton. I'm sure that many of the principles we can extrapolate and apply to place no matter where it is so how does that process begin can you take us into it yeah actually todd gave a pretty good primer and, and i've learned a lot from him over the years and i've done this work in the past but branding a place is so much more complicated and and deep and um ever changing than than branding anything else really is if, you, if you're doing it right so uh it starts with conversations it starts with observations um and so we've had a lot of this is you know going back to earlier this year but we've had a lot of really inspiring conversations with the people who are who choose to make edmonton um home whether it's downtown specifically or whether they have a business uh downtown or, or they just like spending their time here um everyone has a different relationship to the place that you're talking about and so really understanding um why do you find this place valuable? What does it offer to you? Um, what makes it different from, you know, anywhere else you go? Why are you proud to call it home? Um, what sets your soul on fire when you think about this place? Um, like it, it's, it's really, really fun. And I think anyone who's, who does this work, anyone who does economic development work, frankly, like you really have to understand the place that you're selling. Um, it's, it's not as simple as, um, you know, how many natural resources do we have under our feet? Although that certainly helps um, in Alberta's case, but uh, it, it's really about who are the people who make this place what it is uh, and how do we, how do we do their stories justice when we're out there telling the story to the world? And, and I understand the, the premise of, of, you know, you use the word selling, like how do we sell this place? And, and in many contexts, that's what's, that's the whole point or at least it's a big part of the point of, of marketing and branding. But Todd, we've also alluded to the fact that there has been a trend, and I'm not going to say everybody feels this way, but but in particular for audience members of ours in Alberta, I've seen it from a ton of people. It, it has nothing to do, the, the lamentations they feel and express have nothing to do with selling the place. It has to do with the fact that they're embarrassed and they want the rest of the country to know that what is being portrayed or reported on out of Alberta right now is not their Alberta. We're not a bunch of anti-mask, anti-vax cowboys, an old boys club, a bunch of old white guys making all the decisions, scoffing at the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the list goes on. So so marketing and I mean, branding in particular, Todd, the exercise isn't just about attracting new young families and corporate investment, right? A, a lot of it is is helping people feel good or feel proud about where they're from? I mean, am I onto something or no? Yeah, your first audience is is yourself uh, without pride and confidence and a way to talk about 
a place. And then most importantly, to use it for unified action, you don't really have much. And when we started, you know, brand is not a word that people like. Uh, brand does sound like something that a snake oil salesperson might sell. Uh, it sounds like a logo or a new color scheme. And anyone in the corporate world or even works in government, anyone who works anywhere these days, often the word brand comes in when you don't know what else to do. Oh, let's do a rebrand. Um, let's hire an advertising, advertising agency. And so you can see why people do get a little bit cynical about that. But your first audience, like I said, has to be yourself. We use the phrase unifying cultural expression for, for, here, for here in Tasmania, what we're doing around our place brand. And in the first year and a half of our work, we only talked to Tasmanians. And I think it was similar when we were working in Edmonton. We thought, let's, let's create something based on what we heard in our interviews and in our conversations with Edmontonians so that Edmontonians feel they can build and create here. The city's theirs. It's not something that anyone can give them, whether it's the mayor or the premier or the, four, the person who's in for four years. This is, this is about thousands of years, and it's about what we can do as a family, what we can do as a business, what we can do as a community. Uh, together to improve this place. It's ours and reminding ourselves it's ours. And that's how we solve problems. Can we solve problems in the most Edmonton way possible or the most Winnipeg way or the most Calgary way or, or the most Canada way? And if we have that and we understand it, uh, we can do things, I think, that reinforce our best selves. We do it for ourselves first and then it starts to reflect in the national and international media. Uh, of course, if you just tell yourself constantly uh, that or someone tells you, uh, we're one industry, uh, we have one political affiliation, uh, we've always been like that and we always will be, inevitably people are going to feel like, well, I don't belong, uh, even though that story is wrong. And when you sit down and speak to people, they'll tell you something completely different. So the question is, how do you get the story right? Um, and and I want to acknowledge, I'm going to be we're going to be hanging out with uh, Todd and Cheryl for a little bit longer. But Panita, you've got a, a hard out, we call it, in three minutes from now, and we're so grateful that you've you fit us into what I know is a busy morning for you. So let me come back to you before before we'll say goodbye. I mean, how do you get that story right? Like in your mind, to speak regionally, or you can expand it as much as you like. What is Alberta? Yeah, I, I think the first thing that to talk about it puts this into perspective for people. Um, you know, when Governor Cuomo in New York turned out to be the absolute worst and, you know, that dominated the news cycle. Do you think New Yorkers were sitting around saying, oh, this place, I'm so sorry, everyone. Or, you know, when when government Ford, uh, Ford's government are up to all their shenanigans in Ontario, do you think Torontonians are sitting around saying, um, oh, we're not like the rest of Ontario. We're different here. Like, of course they weren't. They know who they are. They know what value their, their land has, their place has, their, their community has. So is there an insecurity um, complex here? I, I, I worry a little bit that that's what it is, right? Like, and that's sort of why, for me, I think this is a bit of a rallying cry. Like, for me, this is a bit of a call for help for any of us who are trying to do this work and selling this place yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to keep doing the work and we're going to try to get the story right and we're going to arm people with, with the right messages and the right stories to tell that we can kind of all start singing from the same songbook. But, you know, before any of that happens, like it, the same thing that they say about negative self-talk, like, you know, negative self-talk becomes self-fulfilling in a way too. If you're constantly saying awful things about yourself, you start to believe it. It affects the way you conduct yourself. It's the, it affects the, the opportunities that you might have in the future. Um, the same can be true of this place. We, if we keep apologizing, if we keep letting our, our story be told through the lens of the, the political shenanigans, um, we're going to be fighting an uphill battle. And so I, I would just encourage Edmontonians, Albertans, wherever it is that you live, um, that you take it personally and that you take personal ownership of uh, the success of the place that you live um, and that you take pride in the things that make it what it is. And, and I want to touch quickly on land acknowledgements too, because that's another thing that's been on my mind. I'm really glad Cheryl raised that. I, I had this discomfort with land acknowledgements um, when I did my first couple of them, you know, opening events for exactly that reason. I felt 
worried that it was sort of going to come across as performative. And I'm like, what, what is this really about? And I, I uh, sat in on a re- webinar with Jacqueline Cardinal, who's just brilliant. And she really helped me understand how we as settlers can do them justice as to do land acknowledgements justice. And it's really about making it a personal expression of our own relationship to the land and our own accountability to the land and what we are going to do as we go through our days, through our jobs, whatever it is that we do um, to help fulfill and be a part of the land and the place achieving its potential and what is our vision for this place and what's the role that we have and the responsibility I'm going to take in, in achieving the vision that I have for this place. So that really helped me recontextualize land acknowledgements and I feel way better doing them now. So uh, I think there might be a recording of it out there somewhere. So I encourage people to go find that. Well, uh, I will say that Cheryl has not stopped smiling and nodding her head since you mentioned Jacqueline Cardinal's name. So we'll find out why that is in just a second. Uh, but Punita, I know you've got another meeting starting literally right now. So I want to thank you so much, not just for making time for us today, but for teeing up and facilitating this conversation. It's a, it's a good one and we appreciate it. Thank you so much. And it's so great to see you all. Yeah, you as well. That's Panita McBrien. She's executive director of the uh, Downtown Business Association here in the city where we're coming to you from the Alberta's capital city, the city of Edmonton. She's also a longtime consultant strategist in, in marketing and branding and communications for public and private sector. She's done a lot of work and is widely respected. Uh, back to Todd Babiak and Cheryl Whiskey, Jack, in just a moment. We want to remind you that our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge are bracing for a big weekend. The final weekend of October, it's their biggest sale of the year, and they've got a selection that's better than it has been in the last year and a half. That's right. Over the past couple of weeks, they've received more than 300 new Dodge Ram 1500s, more than 150 new Grand Cherokees, Gladiators, Wranglers, all of those popular, I mean, the Jeep lineup, gosh, depending on what you're looking for, you, you want something to get you around the city or something to get you deep out into the woods, go camping with the family, maybe some winter camping. There's a Jeep or Ram for you at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. You can find them online. The Big Hall sales event ends on Sunday, this Sunday, October 31st. Also, a big shout out to our friends at Westworld Computers for more than 40 years. Independently family owned, they are your Apple experts. Doesn't matter where you're catching this show from, they'll ship to you via westworld.ca if you're local, so to speak. You can also get in touch to book your service appointment online, or you can talk to them in person by giving them a shout to 780-454-5190. 780-454-5190. It's Westworld Computers. Uh, Todd Babiak and Cheryl Whiskey Jack joining us. Uh, by the way, Todd has a new novel out uh, this week, The Spirits Up, set in Edmonton during the Christmas season. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, Todd, I'm excited to hear about it. I know a lot of people, uh, basically, the minute that Babiak's got a new book coming out, they circle the calendar on the first day they can get it because of the history of what you've been putting out. You know there must read books on my front. I take you with me every time I travel. I've told you that before. But Cheryl, I want to you you still haven't stopped smiling. You're still smiling after Punita invoked the name Jacqueline Cardinal. What connected you with her? Well, if you haven't had her on the show, you have to find a way to get her on the show. She um, just projects light and positivity, and she is all about calling people in um, and getting people excited. Um, and I'm not surprised at all that uh, Panita changed her her view on land acknowledgements after spending some time with her. And I've had the honor and privilege of spending many, many times with her in uh, several meeting rooms and on certain committees. Um, she's building quite a name for herself. And just to touch on what Panita talked about on, as, a, as a settler, she, she talked about being a settler. Um, that's another sort of supercharged word um, in, in Alberta these days in Canada, actually. Um, and it's talked about like it's a dirty word. And I always enjoy hearing um, what newer Canadians feel like when they use that word. They use it as a word of privilege like they and gratitude. And I spent time in Jasper this summer, as probably many Albertans did, and um, seeing so many new Canadians take in the splendor that were the mountains 
um, in, in a different way than maybe second, third, fourth, fifth generation settlers did, um, almost taking it for granted that they're there. But these guys just couldn't stop taking pictures. And that's, you know, they're acknowledging the land to go back to her point. Um, and uh, we all just need to go back to that time and remember what it, when we felt grateful to be a part of this land here uh, in Alberta and in Canada. You know, I, I find it really interesting, too, because I can think, I mean, a ton of, oh, by the way, can I, I don't know if you knew this, Cheryl, but I, I swiped a family photo of yours and I used it for our My Jasper Memories feature this Wednesday. <laughs> um, it, it looks to me like you had an amazing journey. Oh. With, <laughs> I hope you don't mind us using this. It just, okay. my heart was full seeing you with your, with your described womb mates, uh, your siblings and celebrating your dad and, and how special of a place Jasper National Park has been to your family. Those are pretty powerful images over the course of, I guess, what, about 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're settlers here, too. We're, we're originally from Ontario. And so I never stop looking at that place with wonder and gratitude. And uh, and our family are frequent visitors to the place. Well, I, I would love to I want to ask both of you this question. But Cheryl, I'll ask you first. I mean, I think of people have proudly used the word settler or at least settled uh, for decades. And, uh, you know, people would say like, you know, my grandfather settled this land and our family has farmed it ever since. And then all of a sudden, I don't know, three years ago, five years ago, all of a sudden, like you said, it became supercharged. And I suppose that the simple explanation people might throw out there somewhat cynically would be white guilt. But why do you think the interpretation of invoking that word changed? Politics has a lot to do with it, but I also think that it, it uh, challenges their place, uh, placeful right to be here um, in some way, um, and uh, they need to assert their right to be here. And so they talk, they used words like a verb, like my grandfather settled this land, right, um, that asserts their right to be here, and, and they don't need to do that. Um, they came here, they were welcomed here, and we're still welcoming people to this land. Um, and what we're simply asking is that people sort of acknowledge those that came before um, and uh, and the con contributions they've made. And like Kanita said, the responsibility they now have to the land that they're here um, to, um, to enjoy. I think it's great insight. Cheryl, just on a technical note, I think your microphone is caught up in your poppy, um, which is just uh, impacting the audio just a little bit, just to let you know. But this is also my way of letting everybody on the podcast know that you're wearing a poppy right now on October yeah. 29th. So there you go. Todd, why do you think the word settler has changed so much in its interpretation, or at least for some people? Well, your point uh, is good that it's turned political. I mean, I, for me, I've, I've grown up in Canada, of course, and, and then we, our family, we were briefly immigrants in France, and now here we are in Tasmania, Australia. And it teaches you uh, when, you're, when you're part of a culture that's been around for a long time uh, that, that you're, you're new. My accent is funny, or it's obvious to me that I don't understand what it really means to be French. Uh, when I think someone tells us, uh, or it feels like someone is telling us uh, it, in the place we grew up that that we've settled here. But I was born here. Uh, I think it's just people not taking a step back and understanding that we're we're living on. And I think this is an important part of those land acknowledgments. Uh, in Edmonton, we're living on on land that people have lived on for for thousands of years. People have gathered here and and traded here and danced here and, and just enjoyed this beautiful place for so long. And and we're really just here for this this short time to appreciate it and can we connect ourselves to that history it should be a positive uh, but i think you're right wedge politics are very powerful and identity and cultural politics these days it, it's uh, as you saw in the last election uh, in the united states especially really becomes number one it's far easier to talk about that than the complicated work of, of building something together todd is there is this something that that you might describe as a bit of a uh a global trend or at least a trend outside of Canada? I mean, for example, like, you know, you're in charge essentially of branding Tasmania right now. Is, is, has there been an evolution or a journey toward acknowledging more indigenous elements of history and, 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 and better telling those stories? Is this a trend that you see around the world and telling the stories of, of place and helping people connect with place? 
Oh, well, definitely. And if I were to be honest about this place, uh, Tasmanians are, are coming to terms with the fact that the United Nations definition of genocide comes from Tasmania. Uh, the Tasmanian Aboriginal people were, were treated horribly and were, were nearly wiped out by, by settlers. And, and we're told until the 1970s, they didn't even exist. And so now they're reinventing their culture, bringing it back and reinventing their language, which, uh, which was largely lost. And so that is, that is a constant spiritual presence in this place. And I think uh, tapping into that, the good and the bad is, is crucial. It's important and it's honest. And if we don't do that correctly, if we don't do that right and with, with openness and, and honesty and open-heartedness, uh, what we're doing will sound fake, it will sound hollow. And whether that's for, for new settlers to arrive and to, to understand where they're coming and to be fully of that place, or for people who've been there a long time to understand their place and their role and, and creating that feeling. Uh, the feeling that I have when I look at, at Cheryl, when Cheryl gets to talk and I see her on the whole screen, uh, the light coming into her room, the feeling that gives me as someone from Edmonton, uh, that's something you want to fully share and understand. And, and I want to feel homesick when I, feel that, when I see that and feel proud of where I came from and that I was just a part of something, a little tiny part of something that is really big. Hmm. Cheryl, have you, I mean, you, you've obviously noticed, uh, everybody has, I think, the, the, the evolution of, of storytelling or, or branding of place or people's perception of a, of a place. And, and, and it goes beyond land acknowledgements, obviously. Um, you know, I, 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 saw, I saw a guy just the other day in our neighborhood. We live in a heritage neighborhood, a bunch of old houses, 100 years old. And several people fly Canadian flags. And a guy on a street just over from ours the other day put up a second flag he didn't take down his Canadian flag, but he put up a second flag, a Treaty 6 flag. I'd never seen it before. And I just sat and I looked at it for a while. I thought, gosh, that's kind of interesting. And it seems to me to be more and more people have, and for many people, it's a personal journey. It's not a professional endeavor like branding. It's people's personal journey to better understand the place, to better connect with the place. And we're seeing it happen even at early levels, you know, early grades of education and that type of thing. But, but I know that the work is not done <laughs> far from it. And I would love if you could, can I say, give us an assignment? I'd love if you could challenge us as an audience to really move this forward in a way that you think would be truly meaningful. I think, you know, right these days we live in the here and now, we, you know, for the last two years, we've been just trying to survive this virus that's been on the world and um, and so we're really focused on the here and now and even before that, very focused on sort of the present. Um, and what we often tell people when we share our teachings, when we are calling people in to learn about Indigenous people on this land, I always talk about how we have this really awesome prequel, you know, that what's in the news and what's in the history books is the dark parts of our story. Um, but we have this beautiful, vibrant, colorful prequel. And to Todd's point earlier, he talked about, you know, settlers settling the land. Those settlers also have a prequel, right? It's a prequel that brought them to this land. And so I guess my assignment to the listeners is to look at your prequel and, um, and learn that part of your story and how does it color how you look at this place today and how you interact with it and with the people in it and with the systems and how does it influence your politics? All of those things, those prequels are really important stories. Hollywood does them all the time. Hmm. Todd, uh, before we talk about your book, uh, I know a lot of people are excited to hear about it. Uh, along those same lines, could you give us an assignment or something to walk with today after people hear this interview, something to carry forward with and, and make their own impact? Well, I suppose the, what we do, when you asked Panita earlier, what's the process you're going to, to to do this work for the police branding work for downtown Edmonton? When we did this work in Edmonton some years ago, uh, gosh, almost 10 years ago now, we just, uh, we just sat down and had these wonderful conversations. And if you can reach out to someone who, who fascinates and interests you, in Edmonton, if you reach out to them and ask them for a coffee, they'll probably say yes. I'm not sure how things are with COVID these days and having coffee, but... There's some, there's some things we just ask them, and they're often why questions. You know, when you can be anywhere, why here? Uh, 
like I said earlier, if you had to leave, what would you miss the most? What are examples of this place at its best? Uh, if you were to point to what you're most proud of, when you start to listen to people and, and you do this work just for fun and it helps you build a sense of pride and ownership of your, of your city or your province, or your country, your place, uh, it enlightens and, and delights you. And you can talk about what you're ashamed of as well. Uh, when are we not our best selves? And I think going through the civic election that Edmonton has just had and Calgary's as well, it's been an opportunity to see our, what's our best self and what's our worst self. You can sort of see that outlined uh, in, in really stark ways. But it's usually almost always a really inspiring conversation when you listen to someone and you ask them those questions. Uh, if you were to point to the most Edmonton thing you can find, what, what would it be? There's someone put it up on the wall in downtown Edmonton. And uh, when, you, when you hear people tell you these stories, no matter what, uh, you go home happier and you fall asleep prouder uh, that day of, of living where you live. Did you, by the way, do you, I mean, I would imagine you still consider yourself an Edmontonian to a certain degree. Your, your new book is, is based in Edmonton. Uh, did you vote in the recent municipal election? Yeah, I did. I don't think it was counted in the end because the postal service here is really, really mm -hmm. slow right now. I don't think I made it, but uh, symbolically I did in the federal election too. Cheryl, uh, before we wrap this up, uh, I've got a note from someone that says you have to ask Cheryl about taking new Canadians from Syria to Enoch for a powwow. That sounds incredible. Can you tell us the story? Yeah, we uh, we were working with uh, with a community organization called Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers yeah. um, and uh, welcoming Syrians uh, to Canada when they were all uh, coming here. And uh, just in the taste of culture that they got and the taste of worldview, indigenous worldview and um, all of those things, they wanted to go to a real powwow. So we organized uh, two charter buses 75 Syrians um, out to Enoch and Mayor Iveson was there, was welcomed by the chief to be a part of Grand Entry. And he saw this two bleachers filled with men in tunics and women in hijabs. And he went over and said, what's going on here? Like, tell me what's going on here. And so we told him and he said, can I talk about you and my remarks? And he did. And he said, you have a real opportunity here, Enoch, to um, welcome these people warmly to your land, to share your songs, to share your food, to share your stories with them. Bring them, bring the men down to the drums. Women, go grab the women and tell them about your regalia and why you dance, your, the dances you dance. And they did. Uh, and we saw them on their phones saying, you got to come down here. You got to come down here. This is really great. And I just thought what a great way to start your experience here in Canada in, in that way. It was just really powerful. Good stuff. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just like smiling, just thinking about it. And uh, what an amazing experience that must be for someone new to Canada. I think we take so much for granted, right? Like, you know, you grow up somewhere and then you just take so much for granted. And it's really neat uh, to see new Canadians, I think, in many circumstances. Um, I mean, I don't want to go off on a big tangent here, but I, I, refer, I invoked Don Cherry's comments, the ones that ultimately got him canned a while ago, and, and how he had alleged that new Canadians weren't wearing poppies and didn't have an appreciation for, for sacrifices that have been made in service to the country. And, and as a matter of fact, what I thought was good out of that was that people actually investigated and people actually talked to new Canadians and people actually spoke up on behalf of or as new Canadians and said, quite frankly, that's bullshit. And uh, new Canadians in many circumstances actually have a way stronger appreciation for many things uh, that would fit into what a place represents or what a place is all about, including Remembrance Day. I thought that was really powerful. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, no, let me let me allow you to respond to that. I apologize. No, I, I was just going to respond to that. And uh, and my poppy is beaded. Uh, and uh, my dad has one that was with porcupine quills and sweetgrass. And uh, a veteran commented that that's not a real poppy. And, you know, uh, you know, we don't acknowledge those poppies. And, uh, you know, my dad responded with, you know, we have indigenous veterans who weren't allowed into legions uh, and serve this country. And so this is my poppy and I wear it proudly. And so it, it still does generate conversations. Um, yeah. 
I think the conversations along those lines are incredibly important, and I appreciate you making the point. Uh, Todd, congratulations on the new book, The Spirits Up, uh, out just this week. And, and I'm trying to determine because it kind of launches off. In, in two days, we'll observe Halloween. The book kicks off on Halloween, but I've also seen it described as uh, maybe a, a hint of, of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Is this a Halloween story, a Christmas story? Tell us about A Spirits Up. Yeah, if I tried to sell it as a Halloween story, it might disappoint people. But it's on topic, actually. It was really fun to be able to revisit the Edmonton of my imagination for for a couple of years while I'm here in the opposite season. Christmas time in uh, Australia, obviously, is the opposite. It's it's the height of summer. So thinking of what I what we we don't appreciate often enough in Canada the dark season and the cold and the, the magic and even the spookiness of it. Uh, as, I, as you mentioned, uh, Dickens and A Christmas Carol, I wanted to bottle all that up along with some, some really contemporary issues. As Dickens did in, in his Victorian time, I wanted to, you know, in my humble way, write about what is obsessing me about the time we're all living in. So it was really fun to write it, to write about a family, a very Edmonton family uh, living in, I think, uh, a time that is now or into the near future. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a wonderful gift to myself and it's really fun to be able to try to contribute to something I've kind of obsessed with. I didn't really grow up super uh, Christian or anything, but I love Christmas. I love the, I even like the silly parts. I love the look and feel of it. I love the lights in a dark place and the candles and the songs and uh, even, you know, silly things like love actually and, <laughs> Charlie Brown Christmas and stuff. I'm just a sucker for it. And so it was really fun to have that magic in a story. Well, I mean, if you're a sucker for Christmas, you are going to love Cheryl's Christmas tree. Check this out. (laughs) Cheryl, for anybody, I mean, people are going to listen to this on the podcast, so you've got to describe this. People can see it clearly, this image, if they're watching on YouTube. What is it? Is this tree 100 feet tall? Tell us about this. It's, I don't think it's 100 feet tall. It's like 52, 54 feet tall. Um, but it's been I've been in that house since 98. I love Christmas like you, Todd. I'm going to go get your book. And uh, it's been my dream to put lights on that tree. And I finally did it. And I'm calling it my very own Rockefeller. It's like, can I can I clarify? Did you I am I'm not I don't want to no. say I'm terrified of heights, but when I get up on a ladder, I'm like, I OK, I'm terrified. I'm not afraid of the falling. I'm afraid of the stop at the bottom is what everybody says. But you, you got somebody to do that, I hope. Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the wise move. Well, anyway, that's completely impressive and absolutely amazing. Babiak, do you guys do you guys do you guys hang lights where you are in Tasmania? Yeah, we we have the last few years we've been here. The problem is because Tasmania, a little like Edmonton, it's not as it's more like the the southern southern Oregon in North America, but it's still it's still light in the height of summer. So you only get a few hours uh, that people would even see it. So when the sun's going down at at nine o'clock, you know these little weak lights don't make much of a difference to people. But it, it's nice for us, and so we decorate the house certainly. And I think. My daughters, they want to be the, the Instagram marketing team for the Spirits Up. So we'll put up a Christmas tree early this year, which will just delay everyone. So, yeah. Amazing. Well, I mean, in, in past, your books have obviously been been celebrated and, and well-read. Bestsellers uh, included the Garneau Block, which won the City of Edmonton's Book Prize. It was long-listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and, of course, debuted as a stage production as The Citadel. That was that was interrupted, wasn't it, by COVID? That must have, that must have been kind of a... I don't know, a discouraging and then rewarding time to see it finally be able to get on stage. Yeah, well, I had a, an airplane ticket to fly to Edmonton and it it launched on, I think, March 14th mm-hmm. in 2020. And I was, I was coming. And I think that, that was a Friday morning I was leaving and it was the Thursday where I just decided, I don't think this is a great idea. <laughs> I'm really glad I didn't get on an airplane. The, the show was, of course, postponed, and it would have been the worst time in history to be in airport. So, yeah, uh, yeah it was really sad, and uh, then I was very happy, so I didn't get to see it, uh, to, to see it launch and to follow people's stories about the story. And then knowing here I am writing another kind of Edmonton story, I was just delighted. It's the only, those are the two Edmonton stories I've written, so it was nice synchronicity. And what a humbling and wonderful experience to share that with, uh, with Edmontonians. 
Well, congratulations on the new book, The Spirit's Up. Uh, it's now available. You can find it anywhere you get good books uh, by Todd Babiak, of course, in Alberta and abroad, currently the CEO of Brand Tasmania. And it's a real pleasure to have Cheryl Whiskey Jack joining us as well, executive director of the Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society. I'm wishing both of you a great weekend, and thanks again for this. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Sharon. You got it. Bye. It's now 3.29 a.m. in Tasmania. He's a trooper. He is a trooper. He made it look like lighting wise. He made it look like it's in the middle of the day. I appreciate that. I wonder if he'll be able to sleep now. After I do stuff like this, I'm always jacked up a little bit. Yeah, I got to need a couple minutes to wind down. Maybe go for a little walk outside or something like that. It's probably 30 degrees where Todd's at. You know, so annoying. What a beautiful (laughs) part of the world, though. Make sure you follow him on Instagram too, uh, Todd Babiak, and you'll be able to see uh, what he's up to over there in in, uh, just an amazing opportunity for him and his family. If you've enjoyed what you've been hearing here on the show today, we encourage you to to smash that like button on YouTube to share our content. We're so grateful for everybody that subscribes to our podcast, that subscribes to our YouTube channel. And of course, everybody that participates in in, in some of the cooler things I think that we put out every week, including our question of the week. We call it Get Real. Our question of the week presented in partnership with our friends at Y Station, our official research and strategy partners this week. And the, the question's open until Sunday. Why not take two or three minutes and do it now uh, with a lot of political change going on. I mean, different city councils swearing in the the new legislative session sitting. And of course, we saw the prime minister's new look cabinet just a few days ago. What, What are your political priorities as a citizen? What would you like to see with regards to collaboration at different levels of government? We ask you to help us answer these questions by participating. You can go to ryanjesperson.com and click on question of the week. I was telling you how excited we are to extend our partnership with our friends at Local Waste. I had a chance to check in with Mikkel and Chris and Lauren just the other day. And and all I can tell you right now is they've got some really exciting announcements to make over the next month or two and i'm the one that's going to get to make them so that's pretty cool this is a company that has just kept its foot on the gas for 25 years earning the return business of of customers in the construction commercial and residential spaces you can find them online at localwaste.ca if you want to learn more about how they can help you find solutions to your garbage management i mean this could be a a one-time construction job even a big yard cleanup maybe there's an estate situation going on or maybe it's something more permanent maybe you're a business owner maybe you're a landlord and you're just unhappy with the garbage business you're getting from your current provider they're always willing to talk to you and explain why their choice is the best choice via localwaste.ca every friday we wrap up our broadcast week with an opportunity to blow off a little steam to revisit the stories of the week and to to chime in in enthusiastic fashion These are all real emails sent to us by Real Talkers. It's presented every week by Local Waste, a little something we call Trash Talk. Lindsay kicks us off this morning. She says, can we please talk about dysfunctional families for a second? For example, uh, a hypothetical household where one person puts in five to ten extra seconds every once in a while to keep the kitchen cupboards organized, to keep the lids on jars in the fridge, to keep the dishwasher loaded, then unloaded. And and, and then maybe another person in that household acts like these are the types of tiny little jobs that just complete themselves. You stopped living at your mother's house 11 years ago, Brandon. Not from Lindsay. How about this one from Ricky, who says puppies are cute without a doubt, but puppies pee and poo indiscriminately. Adult and senior dogs do not get enough respect, and they know the drill. Ooh, and don't even think for a second about getting a puppy, and then when they get old or older, just ditching them when they become inconvenient. A dog is a lifelong commitment their whole life that from ricky how about this one from morris who says like so many other people i'm appalled 
at the story involving Kyle Beach and the Chicago Blackhawks. He says, by the way, Jespo, I love the interview with Moose yesterday. Thanks for that. We asked Mark Messier about the story. Morris says, this is a public service announcement that there are literally millions of people, though, that volunteer their time and dedicate so much of their effort to making hockey fun and safe and a positive experience for millions of kids. Morris says, it's heartbreaking. It's horrible when we see stories of abuse surface like they do in many other situations. It's heartbreaking every time. He says Stan Bowman was right to step down. He says Joel Quenville was right to resign from the Florida Panthers yesterday. But I'm troubled, says Morris, by some of the comments I've seen about everybody who plays hockey. Morris says it's so important to have these reminders, these red flags, that abuse does exist. It happens But it's also important to remember so many of us care very deeply about the sport and the kids and the adults who play it. That from Morris. How about this one from Jared, who says, I cannot think of a more stressful situation than being at 1% battery on my phone, lost and afraid, and having to change my voicemail greeting so people can come and rescue me. 100% my new voicemail would get cut off before the recording expired, leaving key information missing, and nobody would hear it until I was dead because, earmuffs kids, who the fuck still leaves voicemails? You call somebody, they don't answer, you send a text telling them to call back. I'll stick to calling 911 or in a minor emergency sending a mass text to my loved ones. That from Jared. And of course this from Terry. I know everybody's been waiting for this one. With Halloween upon us, Terry says if you're 17 and trick-or-treating go home, 13 is too old. Sarah, Ryan, I love you both but you're off your bloody rockers. Terry says trick-or-treating is one night a year where people can participate in ridiculous fun, so why are we putting conditions on it? Especially when fun has been so limited for the past two years. Peer pressure is typically what signals kids they're ready to move on from that part of Halloween night. The kids with poor relationships, the kids that have trouble reading social cues, or kids with disabilities might not get that same social feedback. Or despite peer pressure, maybe they just want to have fun. You don't have to know the life of the teen with a garbage bag for a costume. You don't know what it means to some older kids to have you get excited to see them. It might be the only positive interaction they've had for weeks. Plus, there's an added benefit you too. When houses are targeted for theft or vandalism, your reputation might be what stops your bikes from being stolen. Terry says there's far too much going on in the world to waste energy on opinions about the age of trick-or-treaters. Slap on a mask, chat with the kids who show up, and give out the good old candy. That from Terry. I love it, Terry message received. If you've got some steam to blow off, you can send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Enjoy your weekends, our friends. Coming up next week on the show, coverage of the COP26 uh, right from the cover. Wow, what, from Glasgow? From Scotland, Sarah Hoyles? Straight from Scotland. Well done. You killed it this week, by the way. As mentioned, November's National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Leela here just mentioned it. We'll talk about it Monday and on Wednesday of next week, the return of Dr. Jody Carrington. Have a safe one, friends. Hand out the big chocolate bars if you're able, and we'll talk to you soon.